obvious It's so obvious Well, it's so obvious So obvious
Welcome to Tormentor Radio Show. Today, we are together with a major artist in electronic music history. Through his multiple projects, he has carried his inspiration in an impressive number of styles and atmospheres and has forever marked our lives as music lovers. In the same way that his concerts have left their mark on our memories, like this picture of a man alone on stage shouting through a megaphone over his music and under the strobe lights with incredible charisma. This man, this artist, is Dirk Evans. And we are very, very happy and honored to have him with us by phone for an exclusive interview for Tormentor Radio Show. Hello, Dirk, and welcome. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fine now. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be in your radio show. Uh, I was uh, sick in the last week because I had some COVID, but now all is okay. So I'm ready for your questions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so before all that, a short presentation. Uh, we began this program with a selection of six tracks from Absolute Body Control. The first is So Obvious from the first cassette Absolute Body Control, who, which was published in 1981 on the own label of Dirk Evans, Body Records, reissued on vinyl on Diban 2009. Then The Man I Wanna Be from the third album Figures uh, on Body Records 1983, then Sleepless Record Berlin 2013. Then uh, Saturnia Calling from the EP Sorrow, published in 2010 on Daft Records, with the collaboration from Sonic Seducer and Sleepless Records Berlin. Then Melting Away from the album Wine Rewind, which contains newly recorded versions of previous material, initially published on Minimal Maximal LP 2007 and Daft Records 2008. Then Surrender No Resistance from the last album Shattered Illusion on Daft Records 2010 and Earth Takes a Break from the last EP A New Dawn co-published by the Polish label Mechanica and the Brazilian label Noise Democracy Record in 2021. So if you let me, I will introduce a few words for Absolute Body Control. 
Founded in 1979 by Dirk Evans, Absolute Body Control is one of the first bands to emerge from the Belgian electronic music scenes of the 1980s. It was initially formed by Dirk Evans, Verle De Schepper and Mark De Jong, who was replaced in 1981 by Eric Van Vontergem. Inspired by a synth pop and new wave, especially the UK ones, the project quickly became a reference with its minimal and raw music with catchy synth melodies. After three albums and a live album released on Dirk's label Body Records, the project was put on hold as Dirk and Eric joined the clinic. With the release of a split 7-inch with the actor, retrospective compilations on the labels Vinyl On Demand and Tarantula, and a renewed interest in absolute body control in the 2000s, Dirk and Eric began playing live again in 2006 and released the album Wind Rewind in 2007, which contained new reworked versions of older material, taking advantage of improved music production technologies. This was followed by several EPs and a proper fourth album, Shattered Illusions, in 2010, with which the band once again found success, reviving an 80s sound at the same time as the Clinic project came to a halt. The latest release is A New Dawn, an EP released in 2021 on Mechanica and Noise Democracy Records. So we're gonna start directly um, about uh, how you your first uh, r relation with music. What, uh, uh, as we know, you had two earlier projects more in the rock punk scene. But how did you start to in interest yourself for electronic music, and where did th that ideas of uh, building absolute body control came from? Mm, yeah. I started really off in uh, in the punk area. Uh, we we rejected a punk band called Slaughterhouse, and we were uh, with four people in the band. But of course, you are very young, and some interests are different. So suddenly, there was a kind of wave coming from the UK with bands like Cabaret Voltaire and the Human League, and from America, New York, especially with Suicide. I found that you can uh, reduce a band from four members very easily with two and sounds completely as, an, uh, as a full band. So you only needed a synthesizer, a rhythm machine and a singer and to make a, a complete new sound. And for me, when I heard especially the band Suicide from New York, it was uh, uh, completely struck by lightning. It, uh, it took me by surprise. And uh, I immediately knew this is the direction that I want to go. I will buy myself a synthesizer and see what's coming out. So, and that's what was happened. Of course, a lot of bands in Belgium, there was already a scene because, yeah, you had these bands from uh, the UK. Eh? And I know that the bands from like from 242 are also very fond of Cabaret Voltaire and bands like Wire and so on. But we didn't know it from each other. So that's why that every band got his own style because they bought some synthesizers, experiment with it. And uh, it was all yeah, an experimental time. So everybody could find his own sound very easy. Yeah. What was the, the type of gear at that time that you could find that, that you used for the very early absolute body control sound? What types of synths yes. and, and drum machine? Yeah, the first synthesizer that I bought myself was a Mook Prodigy. Mm. And uh, you had also other ones like Cork SH-101 or a Wasp all analog synthesizers and uh, they were affordable because in the in the beginning they were very expensive but yeah suddenly there was a market for them a lot of musicians buy them so they were cheaper and yeah a lot of bands buy and start making new music great so this is how you start uh, in the early 80s how long yeah. did it take did you have already from the start the idea of how you wanted to sound how we wanted to sound, uh, of course, yeah. When you hear the Human League, it was very minimal in the beginning, eh? 
uh, with minimal with a maximum on results. So I uh, thought in myself, okay, a normal band is four people. So we see the rhythm machine as the drummer and uh, and, and some bass uh, sounds from the synthesizer as the bass player. We think in function of a band. So that's why the music of Absolute Control was not never more than four or five layers maximum on top of each other with music. So that's why it sounds very simple and easy and uh, not too complicated because uh, from this minimal equipment and minimal use. Yeah, but uh, what uh, uh, surprised me the, the most is that from the very first tape you had already ideas that uh, are still completely uh, relevant today. Um, if we look at the soundtrack of this uh, first tape from 81, uh, it's open with uh, Waving Hands, which, which is now today one of your absolute uh, most known track probably, I don't know. But I, I suppose, and you rework that uh, track to modernize it. But already all the essence was there from the start. How, how did you work on, on that? Did it came very fast or did you have to work a lot to touch this result? No, no, we worked always very fast. I think every rehearsal we did ended up in one or two tracks minimum because, uh, yeah, it's simple. And of course, when you have to push on a rhythm machine to have the rhythm, you don't have a real drummer. The melodies you can play, we have some melodies in our minds, the lyrics, okay. It's not to say simple, but it's not also very complicated. So for us, it was always the in function of the songs. It sounds good that people that it got stuck in your ears, that it's got a, a commercial side, so to speak, not too difficult, not too far searching for something to make it unnecessary complicated. We wanted to keep it very, very simple, this easy sound. So you just uh, decide to go through uh, directly every year uh, it was a new album coming out until uh, 84. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why is, is there no names in the second album who, who's called Numbers? It's all the tracks are untilted. <laughs> yes, yeah, because I think there were uh, leftovers from rehearsals and then we compile them on one tape but we didn't have t real titles for them. So we thought it was funny to number them like, okay, number one, number two, number three, and so on and so on. So it was also the most easiest way, of course, to, to name the tracks. So it, it means that from the start, you had already lots of tracks uh, for the first yes. album and you, you made a selection for, for the first album, keeping the, the rest for, 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 yeah, yeah. for the second one. Yeah. Yes, because in the beginning we also released a few tapes. F from those tapes, Vus Records, who released a, a kind of compilation, Eat This, he yeah. we took the best tracks to make these uh, compilation. But I think we released first five tapes before we ever released it on CD. Yeah, yeah I think the, f the first CD uh, was in 93 huh, by Vus Records, Eat This. This uh, compilation yes, yes. you spoke of. Yeah, 93 years. So yeah. uh, so it was already in your mind to produce almost non-stop yeah. albums yeah. and maxi also, because there is a, on Blitz record uh, in 81, there is a maxi. Is there uh, an yeah. exist and I am living. And then you choose to put on the side the, the project for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, because you decide to yeah. focus on others idea less easy to to listen and you, you went to to the clinic sound which is really yeah. Yeah. a big uh, big step and very yes. far away from what you you were yeah. using uh, uh, doing for absolute body control and you yeah. decide to come back how does that uh, that that comeback come uh, came from what it uh, the public that asked you to come back or yeah but suddenly People discovered the music of Absolute Body Control because you see the, like the VUS uh, compilation, it was released almost 10 years 
after we released the, the tapes. So, and suddenly I think people discovered it and uh, we were played on many, on radios and on, on, on in discotheques and uh, yeah, there was a lot of demand because in the beginning when Absolute Body Control started, we did not do that many live shows. We, we maybe played 10, 15 times live and that was it. So not many people have seen Absolute Body Control in the early 80s. So, and therefore, there was a, a big demand of the people from, hey, what is going on? Of course, when we stopped and we started with clinic, after clinic, yeah, we started again with Absolute Body Control. So, there was an interest also created by the clinic in what we were doing before that. Eh? So, okay, so so it's it's not coming from the release that uh, the Speed Maxi that uh, came out with the, the actor. Oh, not really, because uh, Absolute Body Control was on many, many compilations worldwide, on albums, on seven inches, and most of it on tapes, because, uh, yeah, there was a, a very big tape scene in those days, and many people sent tapes, uh, compilation tapes, all around, like a kind of mail order thing, uh, art in a way, eh, the exchange tapes, and so on and so on. So. I think, but with the actor, because I did know them before, because later on I discovered the actor was a band from uh, Holland, from Breda, and uh, they did not do that many things. So I think it was more something from the label who released the 7-inch to bring those two bands together. But in, in the 80s, I did not really know them personally. Okay. You start to tour again, and I suppose that you, from the start, uh, had in mind to redo some new tracks and rework some older. That might be the idea behind Wind Rewind, is it? Yeah, because we found that uh, when there was a demand to play live, and once we decided to, to, to go on stage again, we realized that the quality of the packing was not so good, and in the meantime, so many exchanges uh, record music and using instruments and, and everything because we went from analog to a digital area. So we realized we have to record all tracks again and put them in a new sound because uh, it should be more, not harder, but more clearer and more uh, dynamic. The dynamic was very important. And in this way, by recording those old tracks uh, and making new versions, we also uh, started recording new tracks for ourselves. Okay, so from the start in 2007, you, you start to rework and rewrite new stuff. That's how, yeah, you, yeah. That's how you had the Never Seen uh, Maxi. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And uh, from, yeah. from that start, you were touring also a lot. Uh, you, you started with uh, with uh, VGT in 2007, or maybe the year before to, to tour. And uh, and you still uh, receive uh, lots of demand till today. Yes, yes, yes. How, how do you manage that with all the other projects that you have to, to, <laughs> to make space? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question because at one point I was on the road with four different projects. It was uh, a dive clinic, sonar, absolute body control. The best explanation for this is that all projects are, have a very, very different sound. So it's very easy to to split those from, from one to another, you know. Uh, sonar was instrumental, the clinic is, is very dark melodic but it's dark and uh, dive is more EBM eh? absolute body control is more synth pop so once we, we record music we know directly for which project or how the feeling will be for the song so that's not complicated totally not but at the same time you still had your labels so uh, you're a guy that never sleeps yeah, yeah. In the beginning, uh, I had this. I started with Body Records, I think around 1987, because I found that it was very difficult to find a real record label. Because uh, we also sent out some tapes to record labels and we were refused to sign us. So 
we we taught in that period many bands uh, release uh, seven inches on their own they make they went to a studio paid for the recording they went to a, a manufacturing for record and they paid for the pressing all by themselves and mostly they sold all the records when they play live so i was thinking there was so much good music uh, going around these days and they don't have a label they don't find anybody who is interested to release it so i was thinking i will set up body records and the main goal is to release all those good tracks that i like from from the bands all on compilation records so i think the first five compilations i did completely on my own and then in uh, I think uh, in 1990, 1990, I started working with Endler and we released, I think, five records as a co collaboration between Body Records and, uh, and Endler Records. But I found already soon that this whole thing has a very commercial side. It was with a publishing company and for all those beginning of bands, they are not used to this uh, way of working it's it's all too complicated for them and they want to keep it simple they just want to put the records out and then suddenly there is a a record company says yeah we want to release it together but when it's a big success then we want to release it on our own and so on and so on and i felt not really good with it so after two years i said already bye bye to antler and uh, I continued with Body Records on my own until uh, 2002 to concentrate more on the music myself and less on the business side. Thank you, Dirto. It's time to take a first musical break and to present the clinic with a selection of six songs. The first is Closing Time from the last album Eat Your Heart Out, released in 2013 on Out of Line. Then Walking With Shadows from the second album Walking With Shadows, initially released in 1986 on the defunct Spanish label Auxilio de Cientos. Then Sick In Your Mind from the first album Sabotage, published by Three Rio Records in 1985. Uh, the fourth one is Memories from uh, the album Fe uh, The 12 Inch Fear, released on Antler Records in 1987. Then Go Back from the Maxi Pain and Pleasure, published by Antler in 1986. And uh, lastly, Moving Hands from the Maxi 12 uh, Inch Fever on Antler Records in 1988. The five previous tracks can also be found in the compilation box The Clinic 8491, released by Out of Line in 2014.
You're listening to Tormentor Radio Show. We are talking to the man. We continue with our interview with Dirk Evans. And let me present uh, briefly uh, your uh, second band, The Clinic. The Clinic was created in the early 80s by Mark Verhegen. It is one of the main protagonists of the flourishing Belgian electro-industrial scene and offers, with a contribution of Dirk Evans on vocals, a unique form of EBM. Clinic's music combines cold and rough synthetic layers with complex rhythmic structures, distorted brass sounds and minimalist whispered or shouted lyrics, giving the project a particularly chilling and oppressive aura especially on stage, where they appear in long leather jackets with faces covered in bandages. Dirk left the band in the early 90s to pursue his own project. In 2003-2004, Mark and Dirk reunited again, first for a series of concerts, and then decided to work on a new, long-awaited studio album, Eat Your Heart Out, which was released in 2013. Unfortunately, Mark Vergen's health issues seem to have forced Clinic into a hiatus that may be permanent. So, let, let's start a bit about uh, this um, uh, second project of you, uh, the Clinic. Was it in, in opposition to, to the pop new wave that you decided to go more into something rough and a bit experimental and, and even a, a bit noisy too. Where did that idea came, came from? Yeah, yeah. you should know in that time there was a lot, a lot happening on music side and uh, Mark was already a member of uh, a band from Antwerp called Embryo and the Empty and I was busy with absolute body control. So in that time that I meet Mark, he did his first concert with uh, the clinic with, with another singer. And uh, I was really uh, crushed by the sound and how it looked and everything. And shortly after that one gig I saw from them, they that lineup split and Mark was on his own. So I talked to him and I say, hey, I like, I really, really like what you are doing. Maybe we should do something uh, together under the name Clinic uh, to continue. Then we decided to come together and we work it on the songs, I think, almost one year. We were just the two of us. We came together every week. We locked ourselves in, in his room, start making the music directly because it was also a very weird period. The first Clinic tracks are all recorded on two track. This means on a normal tape recorder. Later on, technology changed. It was uh, a four track, DAT, and so on and so on. But the first recordings we did was all on, on, on two track. And uh, yeah, I think it, we did something special. In that time, we had uh, Front 242 from Brussels, who were more EBM. And Neon Judgment also had their own sound, Agroom and Parade Ground, and the clinic was more and more dark. We were inspired by uh, Tangerine Dream and Throbbing Crystal, and we made completely our own thing with it, with these influences. So, yeah, I think it was okay. Uh, with Absolute Body Control, like I said, we did not play that many gigs. I had time enough, something new came up, and uh, the, I met Mark on the, on the right time. He's a, he's a real genius with with his sense and uh, yeah it was the perfect combination and where did the idea came from to have uh, used uh, the use of bandage uh, on your face yeah i think uh, they they already used the, the bandages and the leather jackets when i saw them for the first time okay uh, the yeah it was a little bit different but the the idea was nearly the same So we just took it over and, and we continued with, with what we had. Was it uh, to, to free yourself uh, from, uh, from this, uh, to, to have uh, um, the possibility to play like an actor on, on stage? Also, yes. And the thing was also that for the people it was very confusing because they see somebody, but they don't see an expression on the face, they only could see our eyes. And uh, yeah, that's a strange feeling because they don't know 
what what this person who is standing before him is will do at at one point. The atmosphere was very strange with the leather jackets and the, and the bandages around the head. We used also video screens, uh, a big video screen with videos from operations and so on. Before we played, we had some uh, liquid uh, <coughs> spread in the in the hall with ether that it smells like a like a real clinic. So it was the atmosphere was really really strange and for sure in that time because. There was nothing like that before in Belgium. It was really, really weird. And uh, it sounds very, very dark and very doomy and yeah, very strange. How did you split the works uh, on the clinic? Did the Mark make the, the sound uh, all by himself or did you contribute also? Or uh, did you just uh, have to uh, write and uh, sing the lyrics? Yeah, uh, most of the time Mark already created the music. Then we come together, we listen to the tracks, then I start writing the lyrics, then we come together again, and then we change the structure of the music so that the lyrics and the voice can fit the, the song. So that was the way of that we always worked. Mark made the music, I did the lyrics, and then we worked together on the structure of the song to make it complete for the voice. And this is uh, was the first album uh, uh, that came out in 85, Sabotage, that uh, yeah. uh, most uh, of the public uh, uh, discovered the track Sick In Your Mind, uh, which is uh, also the period where I discovered uh, your track, because it's quite, it was yeah. very popular and played quite in uh, lots of uh, underground clubs at, at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was at that the time the, the the feelings that you had, the feedbacks from, from the crowd? Because um, for what I remember of my own feelings at the time, it was quite scary. And, and um, as you say, we didn't really know if, if it was a play or if it was serious or was quite uh, quite no. shocking how how what uh, how would the, the press and the public at that time react to that yeah it's just exactly like you said and especially with the videos it was more than one time that we saw some people fainted in the audience that they looked to the operation of an eye for example and they just fainted they, they were laying lay down on the on the ground and then with the music very dark and doomy yeah it was very strange and uh, it's not up-tempo music, it's not dance music. However, later on, like, tracks like Hours and Hours, and Sick in Your Mind, and Burning Inside, yeah, they were, they became really uh, dance floor fillers. Every time when they played it, the dance floor goes full. And it's even, even now, and this Sabotage record is almost 40 years old now. Eh? It's from 85. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's surprising that it's still working quite well uh, today. How was your your comeback at the time? Because uh, you had like with absolute body control, uh, uh, lots of production, uh, almost every year something new, and you decided to stop that uh, project to um, go and uh, concentrate on dive at that time. But the the, the project still continued. There was quite lots of release on Offbeat at the beginning and then later on on Ant's production, but with no real relation with the old clinic. Uh, what, yeah, yeah. Mm. what did push you to come back to the roots, to the clinic uh, for, for that album, uh, which is very well produced and uh, lots of excellent track, Eat Your Heart Out. How did that happen? Yes. Yeah, after, uh, yeah, let's say the split, eh? we, we were split up for a long time. I think uh, in 91, the Time album came out and then in uh, the Eat Your Heart Out in 2013. So that's uh, 12 years later. In the meantime, we had not much contact, to be honest. And uh, there was a time that we had to play separate, but Mark with his project and me, as dive on a festival in Germany on the Wave Gothic Treffen, 
and then we we were on speaking terms again and we said okay it's a pity that we can't do something together here tonight but if you want we can do something in the future and that happened yeah, i think around uh, let's say in 2004 we came together again and we did some reunion concert however it took another uh, nine years to complete an, another album because uh, we had material enough but in the meantime mark got sick and uh, yeah the, the, we waited a bit too long then at the end i tried to work it on my own to finish the album i completed the voices everything fall into place again but uh yeah i think it has to be like that mark was also the the reason why the clinic split up in the 90s was that uh, our interest was going different directions musically and i think then you can do two things otherwise you stay together and try to force things but it's no use or you stop for a while and then you can come back again after a long time with new ideas and refresh uh, the whole thing and that's what's happened. We, we're gonna now go into the dive section. Let's play some music now, this time from Dirk Evans' solo project Dive with five tracks. First we have Final Report from the Maxi Final Report released on the Italian label Minus Habens Records in 1991. Then we have Sleeping Away, the second album Country Jungle, also released in 1993 on Minus Habens. Then Two Fates Man from the album True Lies, published by Daft in 1999. Lost Inside You from the album Behind the Sun, published by Daft in 2004. And Slave to Desire from the last album Where Do We Go From Here, released on Out of Line in 2020. And please note that a large part of the releases have been reissued by the label Mechanica. from a neurologic standpoint.
teraz govora slovenskú ministra vanských poslova Dimitria. Tormentor Radio Show in the company of the much more than two-faced man Dirk Evans. So uh, Dive is Dirk Evans's solo project, which he started after leaving clinic in early 1990. It reflects his desire to have a total control over his musical creation. From the start, one can hear minimalist ABM consisting of rhythm loops and radical distorted industrial and electronic sounds. The vocals are often very aggressive and the live performances, although Dirk is alone on stage with his music tapes and a very appropriate strobe-like show, are more than intense. Since 1993 and the second album Concrete Jungle, Dirk started to collaborate with other composers to write his songs the structure of which remains attached to the initial principles, even if melodies start to emerge and the vocals sometimes become softer. Ivan Yusko from Nightmare Lodge, Rafael Martinez Espinoza from Geist Form, and Jan De Wolf from Disconnected have all participated in Dive. The project has also composed film soundtracks and collaborated on numerous projects, For instance, Control Bleeding, Muslim Goes, Hybrids, Disconnected and Boom Scoot. The latest album is Where Do We Go From Here, 
released in 2020 on Out of Line. So, Dirk, could you tell us uh, how you did come to uh, the realization that you needed to compose your own music and how did it begin? Yeah, when the clinic split up, of course, I was on my, completely on my own and I was thinking, ooh, what shall I have to do now? Because I really wanted to continue with the music and uh, alone, it's not so easy. Then I realized that uh, I had to make a sound that with a minimum of equipment, a maximum of sound, loud and brutal, harsh, and also with uh, yeah, the, the strobes, they were the perfect light for this the sound that I wanted to make and also very easy. So I, I started to distort all the instruments. I put distortion pedal, I put it in overdrive, the rhythms and the synths, and the sound became so overloaded that it made extra notes and everything. So it was, for, my, for myself, it was a, a harsh album, a hard, and live it was overwhelming. People see suddenly one guy on stage uh, releasing his devils and only with the strobe lights. It was something completely new for that time. And uh, I wanted to be honest also because I know a lot of sin bands who are with more people on stage, but in a way they don't do almost nothing live. And I wanted to be honest and to say, here I am alone on stage, these are my lights, this is my backing tape, and I do a kind of uh, performance here for you. And I think it was a, it's a very big success because after so many years, even till now, I'm still I'm still doing it. I'm I'm a lot of stage. People ask me, and it's also very easy to travel eh? because it's only me and my soundman. And it's only two people who are traveling on the road, so it's not a complete band that you always have to take care of. So in a way, it was practical, okay, and totally music musically my full taste. At the same time, you were uh, also doing your, your second label, Daft Record, uh, which is probably the label that had the most uh, success and that is worldwide known now, where you were releasing at the same time. I never understand how you managed to do all that at the same time, because um, in 1991, uh, you started to release the Esplendor Geometrico Check El Jamal and tons of other stuff came at the same time while you were uh, touring and doing dive uh, at the same time. How did you organize yourself uh, with the label? Because everybody uh, can imagine that uh, a label is uh, quite a lot of work with the promotion and, and the, the, the distribution of all that. Uh, contacting the band and, and all the stuff. How could you do that? the two things at the same time? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Afterwards, I realized also that it's not not so easy, but uh, the most work was always uh, one week before the release. When the, when, the, when the release arrived at my house from the pressing plant, and to send it out to the distributor and to do advertisement and so on, the mailing. I think it was one week always very hectic, but for the rest it was okay. Contacting the band, they send them, they sent some music. I went to Eric from Wontergem, the other guy from Absolute Body Control, who was doing mastering in his studio program. So they make the master. I have to send, it was reasonable, it was okay, but at one point, yeah, the business side is taking over from the from the musical side, and uh, the CDs in the beginning were selling very well. But at the end, when I stopped, it, it was not worth it anymore. I prefer if you have to do the same work for an amount of 2,000 CDs, or, or you have to, all the same work for selling 100 CDs. Then the difference is too big. It was not worth it, and I decided for myself to concentrate on, on making new music on my own, for my own project, instead of letting the business side taking over. This being said, I mean, I'm very proud because uh, all we released on Daft Records were 
most were all my favorite bands. Standard Geometrical, Numb, uh, uh, many Portion Control, even Front 242, Neon Judgment. Yeah, it, the, the catalog is huge. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I even, mean. Even Martin Reeve from uh, Suicide. From Suicide also. Yeah. Yeah. I met him in, uh, in New York when I was there. And, uh, It's, it's always very nice to, to meet the people in real do, who inspired you so much. Eh? Yeah. Like uh, it's, it's also for uh, Espendo Geometrico on, on Daftecos. I released the first CD that the band released b before that. They, they didn't have any CD. It was only on vinyl or on tape. So I released the very first CD of Espendo Geometrico. It's also a very nice feeling, eh? Yeah, it's also the label that uh, brought to many people uh, Esplendor and Geometrico outside of Spain because at the very beginning it was uh, very informed people and it was quite uh, obscure outside of uh, the, the Spain frontiers and you, you brought it to, to life and it, it became uh, enormous. Uh, Um, and now Esplendor Geometrico is uh, worldwide known and have played everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yes, in the beginning it was not so much, they were not so much known in the small scene, but in every interview I did, when I was on tour as Dive and they did an interview or whatever, I always mentioned uh, the name Esplendor Geometrico and, and so on, uh, yes, I did like many bands like Stigma from France, the Syndicat from France, many bands, the Second Table from Japan. Yes, excellent. It's like I said, yes, a lot of, of favorite bands, Black House from America, uh, yeah. Yeah, many favorite bands. I was very, very happy, but at one point it's okay when the sellings are going down and it's not worth anymore to put all the energy in it, then it's, then it's time to stop in a way. Eh? Yeah. Afterwards, I also made another label, Minimal Maximal. It was only for vinyl, and we released also a lot of vinyl. But it was the same story. In the beginning, the vinyl sells good, and then yeah, when when there is one successful band, a, a bigger company is trying to take over, and uh, it was more always with the business side. And yeah, now I'm happy. I only have to concentrate on making music myself. Now it's much better. And uh, speaking of which, uh, I would like to know, how did you uh, end up uh, collaborating with uh, all those people for Dive? You started collaboration with uh, Ivan Yusko and then Rafael Espinoza and Jan de Wolf. How did, uh, did yes. that happen, since you were willing to have total control over your, uh, your music? Yeah, so Ivan Yusko, I, I released some, uh, in the beginning, some releases on his, on his label and then he sent me some tracks, he asked me to start working together and I also realized uh, the sound that I make in the early dive, I did it completely myself, but you cannot keep on continuing doing that, so you have to make, bring progress in your music and Therefore, it's always very nice to have uh, other ideas and have other sounds as long as you stay 100% yourself in the whole project. And I think it's the most important thing. So I was, I was always open for collaborations, really. And, uh, but not that people say, ooh, this is not sounding like Dive anymore, then it's not good. In my opinion, it, uh, it has always sounded like that, the modus operandi, the way the, the songs are structured has never changed. Maybe uh, a little bit softer from times to times. Uh, no. but, uh, well, uh, you cannot, but one cannot do the same thing all over again, so uh, it's okay for me. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, Dive got a, a real strong identity, so most of the time you know when it's a Dive uh, track. But um, uh, you had also the will, because uh, I know that you are a music fanatic and that when you have time, you uh, rush like we do into shops uh, to get some new music. Um, how does that, that infect, affect your life and um, how is your consum uh, consummation of music? Is it still strong? 
video yes, it's still strong uh, I love to go to uh, to live concerts uh, old bands new bands yeah like boy harsher or ultra sun or whatever uh, last weekend I saw the damned so that's something completely different but I feed myself still with, with music of course in the corona time there was almost uh, three years nothing yeah eh? yeah so, and that was uh, not so easy but in a way yeah uh, it took only uh, also advantage because I made uh, the last dive album the absolute body control starting with a new band called uh, the motoric thing so uh, I mean, it's it's always good and uh, I don't listen that much to the radio. I try to, I, I surf around on YouTube. I try to find new bands on the internet and so on. Yes, I'm still uh, hungry for new things. Yeah. How did you come to release a split album with Paul Lemos and Controlled Bleeding? Yeah, how come? Uh, I think it was already in 1989 or 90 i started to work on kk records in belgium and they licensed a controlled bleeding album uh, called the music from the searching ground so and it was the time that i went for the first time to new york and with kk records as a part of to go to the music seminar and we had a meeting with paul Emos and we spent some fantastic time together in, in New York and uh, yeah later on uh, it, it was by accident I think that the one guy from a Portuguese label asked us to be on, uh, on a compilation in 96 mm -hmm. so it's a long time ago but Paul Imos I know him personally and because yeah normally control bleeding with three people and there are already two people died from the band yeah. so We, we had the chance to interview Paul uh, interviewed Paul Elmos uh, last year last year well, in, in July yeah. Yeah, yeah with lots of interesting stuff it was also like with you uh, uh, a very long productive uh, career and I hope yes. that you you both will uh, uh, continue on that It's now time to uh, play uh, some new music tracks and this time it will be from your third project we are going to talk about Sonar. We selected not less than seven tracks and the first is Disconnected from the first album Sonar released on CD by Daft and on vinyl by Anzen in 1996. Then Shotgun Radio from the second album Overdose Simulation published on Daft Records, the Japanese label Gift, and the American Cop International in 1998. Then Leave Me Be on Remote Assault, Daft Records 2000, Tone Lock from Vault Control on Daft Records 2003, Sway recorded live at the Staple Varagem in Belgium in 1999 and available on the self-released CDR Cosmic Live Rays, self-released in 1999. Then Melty Dream from Cut Us Up, published by Ant Zen in 2012. And to finish Tango Mechanic from the last album Shadow Dancers, released on Sleepless Records Berlin in 2014.
speaks for itself.
Tormentor Radio Show for the last part of our interview with someone, somewhere, and more precisely Dirk Evans himself from Belgium. And let me introduce Sonar, which is a duo formed in 1996 by Dirk and Patrick Stevens, who worked together on the first two albums. Eric van van Targem joined the project in 1998 after Patrick left. Through Sonar, Dirk Evans explores a noisy techno-industrial path, largely inspired by the Spanish industrial project Esplendor Geometrico, but with a much more brutal sound, sometimes close to Japanese noise. Although Sonar is one of Dirk Evans' most radical projects, his music, built on rhythmic trances and hypnotic structures, is perfectly suited to the club. We should note that the collaboration in 1998 with Muslim Goes, the experimental and ethnic and electronic project of the British uh, Brindo Jones, who passed away shortly afterwards and whose discography is absolutely monumental. The latest album is Shadow Dancers, released in 2014 on Sleepless Records Berlin. To start with uh, Sonar, I suppose that uh, as you were a big fan of uh, Esplendor Reometrico, you wanted to push a bit farther to what uh, they were doing at the time. Because uh, when we were re-listening to that first album, it's still a very efficient album, uh, still today, and did not age at all. What was the idea behind uh, the Sonar uh, musical direction? With Dive, I was already a few times. I think I did two uh, big tours with the Spender Geometrical together. Mm. And uh, the sound of this duo is incredible. Eh? Live, the, the, the dancing stuff, it's harsh, but it's danceable. And uh, I really, really love this band. So I really wanted to do something in the, in the same way, so to speak, instrumental, danceable. But of course, it should should sound not the same so when when me and, and patrick started to be we, we had a more much more brutal sound than a spender of course eh? and uh, yeah again in belgium in that electronic scene ebm wave electronic scene something like sonar was not heard in a, in a way also you were an inspiration for many many bands who came later on the Ansen and hans label and uh, many bands, uh, they, they, they name us as an influential uh, for their own starting to make industrial music. And for ourselves, in every interview, we said that we got the inspiration from Espanol Geometrico, but that we try to do something different. Eh? Yeah. And uh, I think we, we played many live shows and uh, with Sona. In Paris, we played at the Locomotive a few times. Mm. It was always very good, uh, always very danceable. People really loved it. So, yeah, it's not easy to to bring a lot of variation in uh, in instrumental albums. But I think we succeeded along the way. I think we released uh, seven or eight full-length albums. So that's uh, also already an achievement. Yes, I saw you uh, more than twice. The first one was at Locomotive, but you also played at the Gibus with a certain DJ Chaos starting wars with uh, his uh, turntables. Do you remember that date? Yes. I, th I think it's a, a period where um, most of the French scene discovered also a harder sound uh, as uh, Chaos was uh, spreading in, in France because he's the very one, very first one to have uh, make this junction between industrial noise and techno uh, roots so which is exactly what you did pushing it uh, yeah. uh, further than what Splendor Geometrico was doing because yeah. as you said uh, you had also this uh, um, love for noisy stuff uh, we can hear that clearly in the first album where you have tracks that are um, very Japanese oriented um, yes, yes, yes. Was it already at that time something you were listening a lot? Or? Oh no, no, we we did not listen to Japanese stuff. We only uh, <laughs> we did our own stuff because, yeah, of course I know Mesbao, but you cannot compare Sonar with Mesbao. Mesbao is more it's, it's a complete wall of noise. Eh? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> 
but for the rest, no. Uh, we we simply did our completely our own stuff. We came together, me and Patrick, and uh, of course Patrick came came out of another scene. He was more in the yeah, in the more in the danceable stuff, in the in the break beat and so on. And uh, yeah, but that's that's the most interesting of all in, in creating music, eh? That you try to bring different worlds into one by making collaborations with other people and so on. Because when I see it, all those projects like Absolute Body Control and Clinic and Sonar and Dive, it was all in a kind of period in my life. In every period, it came, it fitted perfectly what we were doing for that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. And you had also, it's, it's uh, something that we can feel in music. You had the will to push uh, all the boundaries from what was going on at the Zesperius always further. So uh, is it still something that you have in mind today? No, but uh, yeah, that's that's how I feel. Eh? I mean, I, I'm lucky that I always have, uh, could do 100% what I liked. I never had to make concessions or whatever to, to labels or to other people. And yeah, the music that I, that I make is also the music that I really like. So yeah, and, and I'm very lucky that I can divide those kind of music in, in, in different styles, eh? like sonar or absolute body control or clinic or dive. That's my strongest point, I think, that, that I can work for myself in, in a way that, that it's interesting for people and that they hear the difference in the music that I make. Yeah. You're gonna tour uh, in the near future. What are the dates uh, that uh, and, and which project are gonna be seen on stage in uh, until the summer? You have some dates to give us. Yes, but uh, the most live dates are now uh, for Motorik. It's uh, that's a new project, uh, crowd rock oriented. It's with uh, three people on stage, uh, two guitar players. One one of those players is me and a real drummer, and we have a bass sequence. So, the most concerts are coming up are for Motorik now. We played with Sonar uh, last concert in uh, in Belgium at the Bimfest. We were headlining the Bimfest. It was the first show after six years, and it was a big success. So I hope we can do some more with Sonar in the future, but. For the moment, I'm, I'm more concentrated on the motoric thing now. Okay, for this uh, reason, we're gonna jump into motoric now to introduce a bit and to speak a bit about it. So, motoric was formed in 2018 with Dirk and Jory Dobeler on the guitars and Dries Dolander for the drums. Three albums have been already released uh, uh, on Out of Line in 2019, 2020 and 2022. An EP was also released on Anzen in 2022. Although Motorik is a crowd rock in nature and is inspired by artists such as uh, La Dusseldorf and Neu, the project is detached from the classic 60s and 70s influences and offers a more minimalist, probably less technical or fussy crowd rock with a 80s sounds, almost new wave-like sounds, probably more accessible to an audience used to the 80s music. So uh, it's uh, what uh, to me was uh, very important about Motoric is that you managed to do this link uh, between the 70s and the 80s that, that never really exist uh, at the time was this new project. Was it uh, the will from the very first beginning to make that or did it just came naturally like that out? Yeah, I think it came natural. It's also the way of recording them, eh? because the bass sequence sounds very actual and uh, very dynamic. And uh, of course, with a real drummer to give it extra power. And we have two guitar uh, players to make layers of sounds on, on top of it. If, if you compare it with bands like uh, Noi, then that music is very good, but the way of recording was very minimal also, and you hear you hear it in these old records, so that the sound is not very optimal. And now, for this reason, the the Noi record is 50 years old, so 
of course the the way of working changed a lot so the the, the dynamic of the music that we make is much more more stronger so in a way yeah I think we found the right combination now to bring the 70s and the 2020s together now with this new band. Yeah, I was uh, really surprised uh, when I was uh, preparing this uh, show because it, it is probably something that has not been done uh, today is to be able to bring to a younger uh, public uh, the crowd truck roots. Um, because most of the time when we uh, do crowd truck uh, interviews or when we speak of it in our show, uh, we see that most of the time the public is really older and you manage to did that uh, to, to, to do that with motoric to to bring younger people into sound that never heard before. Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's also important for younger people that they can discover uh, another sound than the one that they are used to listen to. So for them it's also a real nice surprise when we play on a festival with some bands that they know and they don't know us and they see the dynamic and how danceable it is. For them it opens also a new world and so it's it can only be positive for them that they like our sound so much. We see it on the festivals that we played recently. There are also uh, many people who don't know us, but when, after the show, many people come to say, fantastic, and what a sound, and then we enjoyed it. And, and, and so that's, it's only, only positive. Yeah, and I think that now that you're gonna play more, and I hope that you're gonna come to, to Paris uh, very soon, because it's the only I hope project. It too. <laughs> that we never saw. You didn't play at all with Motorik in France? No, no, never, never. Do, do you have some dates that you're gonna play this year? Probably in Belgium and Germany, I think. Yes, yes, we have some dates and we have some requests from Slovenia also. But that will be for 2024, I think, because that's a lot of driving and then we have to build a, a real tour uh, around it. But mm. ah, mm. if some people or organizers are listening to your radio show and they like what they hear and they want to book us then they can always contact me i'm easy to find on facebook so uh, we are interested we want to play as much as we can and a lot and where we can so <laughs> so to explain to those who would be uh, could be interested you are three people on stage uh, do, do yes you, do you have your sound engineer with you Yes. So you're four to, have to travel. Yes, we are four to travel. Yes. And yeah. what material do you, do you need for for the stage? A drum and what what do you? Yeah, but we bring our own material. Eh? We yeah. bring our own material. We have a drum. We have a drum kit and we have the bass sequencer and we bring our own amplifiers and our own guitar. So that's it because it's a motoric. It's instrumental music. So no no microphones or whatever. Yeah, no voice. And and you're using a bass line, huh? Yeah, there is no bass on yes, stage. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's still quite minimal, m minimalistic uh, project. You know, not 20 people on stage. So it's so yeah. <laughs> something that is quite yeah. affordable for even a smaller place uh, to play. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really think that uh, uh, I hope that you will uh, come to Paris. I'm calling everyone around uh, and push them to listen to this show and to go uh, and listen to your Bandcamp uh, page uh, for the Motoric album because I think that is the good idea of the year is to to bring Motoric uh, and to yes. let people discover this project that is not that well known for the moment in France uh, uh, compared to all your other projects and maybe no, people no. will be also surprised to see you back into rock and roll which is what, yes. you, <laughs> what you did at the very uh, early stage so um, yes 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 was it a, a, a yes. will for you to play again guitar Yeah, because in the in the first punk band when when I started in the late 70s and now for Motorik I use the same guitar that I played in the very first beginning. So the circle is slowly closing. <laughs> I think it's ah, but okay, we will see what happens. On the on the 5th of May 
there will be a new album, the fourth will come out on Out of Line. So, and it will open new doors again. I'm, I'm really, really sure. This is exactly what we wish uh, for for Motorek, and we hope to see you very soon around. Um, do you have uh, still the will to do some collaboration, or is this something that is behind you already? No, for the moment, no. I, I did so many things. I think one of the last ones I did was with the uh, agent Sidegrinder from Sweden. We did a uh, 12 inch together. But for the moment, no. I think priority now is Motorik and uh, we will see. That's the most important now to get the band really started because uh, we had the bad luck that uh, when we took off one year later, the Corona started and it took more than two years uh, and a half before we could really play live again. So we have to take care for that first instead of making collaborations with other people now. My time is running out also. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that. So we're going to leave you uh, alone because I know you're busy today. Uh, thank you a uh, hundred times uh, for that interview. We would love to talk with you uh, for hours and hours, but we have to conclude this interview with the presentation of the most recent of uh, your list of projects, Motorik. We're uh, going to listen to six tracks, first of which is Sliding from the first release of Motorik, published in 2019 by Out of Line for the CD and the LP and Wool E tapes for the cassette. Uh, the second one is also from the first release, is called Stellar. Then we'll have uh, two t titles from the second album, Motoric 2, Sundown and Ritual. That album was published by Out of Line in 2020. Then we will have Socrates uh, from the third and last album, Motoric 3, also on Out of Line and released in 2022. And to complete that, Odyssey from the EP of the same name, published on 7-inch uh, by Anzen in 2022. Thank you again very much uh, about uh, this interview. And uh, I wish you lots of fun with the uh, Motoric Tour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very happy we did this interview finally. And uh, yeah, who knows? One day I will come in Paris mm -hmm. and then we have to meet. Eh? Oh, yes, yes, of we'll course. We'll be very happy to, uh, to buy you a, a drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course. Uh, let us yeah. know and we will spread the word around us. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Have bye a bye. nice day. Thank bye. You. Yes, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You.